this great presentation on tumor profiling. We're very lucky to have two experts with us, Dr. Sharon Lewin from Holy Name Hospital in New Jersey, and Diana Turco, who is a uh, genetic counselor and the National Science Liaison, Liaison for Myriad Genetics. And so they're going to update us on, um, there've been so many changes these last couple of years. And I think all of us want to understand how um, understanding more about our personal situations, our own, the, everybody's own um, the biology of your own tumors, your own genetics, how that's influencing your treatment. And so we've got the, um, we've got the great, uh, heads on that for um, for our presentation tonight. And again, sorry, I'm kind of hesitating. I'm trying to admit people from the waiting room and keep talking, <laughs> which apparently I'm doing a, a half half job of. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm so pleased to have you all here tonight. Now, I don't actually I don't even know who's going first of our two guests. Okay. Diana, why don't you um, unmute and take it away? Great. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, it's not very frequent that I get to speak with patients and advocates and their families. So this is a fun opportunity for me. I am, my name is Diana Turco. I am a genetic counselor and I work for Myriad Genetics. Um, so I spent uh, some time as a genetic counselor um, in clinic and, uh, and used to meet with patients all the time, but now I work in the laboratory side. Um, I am trying to share my screen, but it says that I'm not able to, the host has to allow me. I'm sorry, Diana, we'll fix that right now. Oh, no problem, I'll just keep going. Um, so my very first slide just has my name on it, so that's pretty easy to cover, but it also, um, just so I wanna make it, Super clear. I work for a laboratory, um, and so that is my conflict of interest. If I ever, um, if I ever do an academic talk, then I always have to make sure that's really clear that I um, I'm employed by a laboratory. And some of the things that I'll talk about today have nothing to do with that laboratory, and some of the things are tests from that laboratory. So uh, just want to make sure everyone's aware. And uh, I am really informal. If you have a question, raise your hand, wave around, interrupt me, that is completely fine. Because I know some of the things that we're talking about are, um, are a little uh, what I like to call nerdy. Um, they're pretty scientific. Uh, and so I like to use a lot of analogies, but if that analogy does not make sense, then stop me and I will um, explain it in another way. Uh, but the main thing that we're talking about today is tumor genetic testing. And I'm not going to spend very long talking about hereditary or germline testing, but I want to make sure that everybody understands the difference. So whenever people do genetic testing, it can mean a couple of different things. And if you look at the woman on the left, I, I'm less concerned about the words on this slide and more concerned about the figure. So if you look at the woman on the left, when we did genetic testing on her, we only tested that green circle, her tumor. Um, and so that is sometimes people will say tumor genetic testing, tumor profiling, which I believe was the title of this meeting. And then they might say um, somatic testing, uh, which is just another way to say tumor testing. Um, I'm just letting people in also from the waiting room because I get that signal. <laughs> so if, if there's anybody that I'm supposed to block, you let me know. Um, then the woman on the right, she did germline testing. And so in germline testing, sometimes people will call that hereditary testing. Uh, and that means that we're testing something that you were born with something that can um, maybe in the terms of a BRCA mutation predispose you or give you a higher risk to develop different types of cancer. Uh, and it can be passed down through the family tree to your children. It might be shared by your siblings. 
Uh, so somatic testing, the woman on the left, again, is just her tumor that is not passed along through a family tree at all. Sometimes we might do a tumor test and we have a result that we could also find in your germline. So it's always nice to make sure um, that you get a copy of your report, that you're able to share it with your physicians, um, and so that everybody can know our, what are we talking about. And if we found it in the tumor, do we need to follow up and also do it in your germline to see if it's shared in your family or vice versa? So there's a couple of different ways that it can go about. Um, but as particularly in ovarian cancer, it's usually helpful to at least, well, Dr. Lewin's gonna touch on this. I know she's very passionate. Everybody with ovarian cancer needs germline hereditary testing. And, um, and lately, most women are starting to do also that somatic or tumor test. So if you ever have questions about what you had done, get a copy of your report and talk about it with your physician. So this is a really, I have a lot of my slides are somewhat busy, but I'm always gonna try and summarize and simplify them. Um, but if you ever attend, if you end up in an academic meeting or attend the Society of Gynecologic Oncology, there's gonna be some sort of slide like this. So we know that DNA is, double-stranded. It's like a ladder, a, a twisted ladder. I think we've all seen some art, artsy or um, cool pictures of DNA. And there's two main ways that that DNA can be damaged. Either one of the strands or one of the sides of the ladder is broken or both. And when we talk about both sides being broken, we rely on a certain feature in our cells to repair that break called homologous recombination. And the BRCA1 and 2 genes live in that homologous recombination repair. So if you have a BRCA gene mutation, either in, in you and your germline or just in your tumor, that means you have something called homologous recombination deficiency or HRD which is a pretty big buzzword in the world of ovarian treatment lately. So HRD means homologous recombination deficiency. And all that means is that your double-stranded DNA, when it's broken, it cannot be fixed very well. So I consider homologous recombination like super glue. Its job is to put everything perfectly back the way it was. If you have HRD, that deficiency, then what your body is relying on is other things, these other features or these other repair mechanisms that are in gray. And those are like scotch tape. So if, we, if you had a broken coffee mug, homologous recombination would super glue that handle back on there and you could drink your coffee again. If HR was deficient, you had HRD, then what would happen with scotch tape is that it would just scotch tape that handle back on, and I certainly am not going to lift that mug full of hot coffee. That scotch tape is not going to work, and that causes lots of damage in our cells. So the question is, in a, in a tumor, do we want to repair all those and make them healthy? Do we want to get back to that super glue? Um, and that is an extremely difficult task. We can't do that. So instead, we're trying to figure out how to push that tumor cell over the cliff. Just make it die instead of fix it. <laughs> and that can be done with a PARP inhibitor. So hopefully, um, let me know if that term is not familiar, PARP inhibitor or um, the different drugs with PARP inhibitors. Um, that would be like Limparza or Zajula. Um, some people use the more scientific name of olaparib or neuraparib, uh, but those drugs are all PARP inhibitors, and they try and further break the DNA so it cannot be repaired. Um, so if you have homologous recombination deficiency, your tumor cell is getting all kinds of damage, and then if you take a PARP inhibitor, it shoves it off the cliff. It's just trying to kill that cell. And it's the pairing of those two features, taking, 
knowing that the tumor is HR deficient and then taking a drug that really helps um, cause tumors to shrink or help improve patient outcome longer term, um, longer survival before tumors grow. Uh, all of that is a really complex way of kind of going through it. So I also like to think of it like this. So this is a much simpler picture. Uh, but I think about your tumor cells as a table, four-legged table. And if you knocked one of those legs off, let's say you have homologous recombination deficiency, that leg is knocked off, that table is still going to stand. It's a little wobbly, but it can stand up. And what a PARP inhibitor does is it takes out a second leg. And so that table falls down. So you, we know that PARP inhibitors tend to work much better when one of the legs is already knocked out. So I'll pause here. If you want to jump in, you can type in the chat. You can try and raise your arms around. I can't see everybody. Or you can unmute and ask me a question. Um, but that's sort of what we're working with. PARP inhibitors work best in a tumor that has HR deficiency. I have a question. Yeah. You, so how do you determine uh, original tumor surgery was done 2017. How do you determine if the tumors um, that you had or have are, are heard? How do they test them? Um, basically, I've been told that the tumors I have are very difficult to get to, and that um, do they do they? I've had many years of chemo. Do they are they should they go back and test the original? Um, honestly, the best answer is we'll test whatever we can get. So. It can be testing a metastatic site. It can test original tumor, but the best tumor to send is the biggest one. <laughs> That's the most can, likely chance that you're going to get a good result on it. Can it test pleural fluid? I'm having pleural yep. effusions. Yep. Okay. They can test. Yep. They can test that too. Really, some of the only things that we can't test are um, bone metastases, just the way that it the things change when it's on the bone is not able to be tested um, or brain metastases. And your physician would send it direct to Myriad? Um, that is, yep, yeah, that is one option. And so we'll talk a little bit more about um, okay. the, the actual testing itself. Okay. Um, and I saw somebody asked a question about BRIP1. Um, and so I will definitely get to that actually in just another slide or two. And then, um, uh, and then, yeah, I see some questions rolling in. So I'm gonna keep, I, it's great that I have some in the chat. So I, I've got them noted. Um, and if I don't get to it in like the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna take another look back at the chat to just to double check. But I, I should be able to answer all of these as we keep going along. But these are really good questions. Yeah, there um, are some really good questions, and I just wanted to also clarify, and it's great if you want to catch them as you're going, but if you don't want to be um, back and forth, I'll make sure to definitely read through every single one when we get to the Q&A, just so okay, great. If, it's in the, if it's in the chat, it will be read. Great. Thanks. Um, I do see one question. Are all of our tumors tested? So some of this testing, some of this HRD is a bit newer, like... Like uh, we said at the beginning, it's been a really kind of crazy year <laughs> um, and in an exciting way. Uh, so if it's been more than a year, maybe not. Um, and then as I was saying too, with the difference between germline testing, testing you, what you were born with, or tumor testing, it's good to just try and pull up old reports to see exactly what all has been done to sort of make sure all the boxes have been checked. So what causes HR deficiency? And on the slide before you saw BRCA. Um, this is also something if you attend a scientific conference um, that you'll see some version of this. Um, also, I'm gonna apologize. I have four sons um, and my door is locked, but they're noisy. <laughs> um, 
So when you attend in a scientific conference, they show a lot of pathways or families of genes. So this picture is of the homologous recombination family. All of these genes work together to make sure our DNA is getting repaired. And you can see in the middle, BRCA1 and 2 are the largest. Uh, and so those are two of the most important genes. Um, I kind of think about it a little bit like a football team too. So again, I like analogies, but this football team, uh, the quarterback would be BRCA1 and 2. Uh, so like would the Tampa Bay Buccaneers be in the Super Bowl if they didn't have Tom Brady? Probably not. Um, so if your starting quarterback goes out, you're probably not going to win the game. So if BRCA1 and 2 are gone, you have HR deficiency. The other genes that you see listed in here um, on this team or in this family, some may be more or uh, some, be, some may be really important players and some may be less important players. Uh, for example, we think, so we're starting to learn more and more. We don't know everything about this whole team yet. We're starting to think that genes like PALB2 and RAD51 are very important players. Whereas other genes like CHECK2 and ATM and NBN are not. And when I say important players, like that's important information if it was done on a genetic germline test for you and your family. When I'm talking about the importance of is would that person benefit preferentially from a PARP inhibitor drug or not? Um, I saw somebody ask about BRIP1. That is truly one that's in the gray area. We don't know a lot about it yet which means that right now, BRIP1 is not an indication for prescribing with a PARP inhibitor. Um, it, maybe it might be in the future. Maybe we'll learn a little bit more, but not sure at this point in time. Um, so it's, uh, I guess that's, uh, nobody likes to be in the middle in the maybe zone, um, but there are other things that can be done to kind of try and figure out if you would benefit from PARP therapy. Um, and then really the main point of showing this information is that, yes, we can talk about all these genes that were listed on the slide before or that are listed on the left, but we, what I really want to move towards talking about right now is that ring on the right-hand side where you see BRCA1 and 2 and some of those other genes do cause HR deficiency, meaning that you would be a good candidate for PARP therapy but there's 24% of ovarian tumors have HR deficiency for other reasons. And in total, half of women with ovarian cancer have HR deficiency. And that's a pretty, it's not great. We'd, we'd love it if we could find 100% of people that would benefit from a drug, but starting out with half is a pretty good start. Um, so half of women would be HR negative or their their repair mechanism is doing pretty okay and the other half would be HR deficient and this I don't even talk about this particular slide with physicians or, or anybody that's even like an HRD specialist this slide the purpose of it is to show you all of these little wedges of the pie are different causes of HR deficiency so it's pretty difficult to be like, okay, I'm going to test for that and that and that and that and that. Like, did I get all of this done? That's pretty tough. <laughs> and if we look at the top left of the pie at like 10, 11 o'clock, you see other. And included in other is, I don't know, <laughs> which is not, which is a tough thing to test for, something that you don't know about the cause. So I, I like to talk to people about flipping the, their brain about how they were thinking about this. So far, we've talked about what is homologous recombination deficiency and some of the causes like a BRCA mutation or anything on all those like on that busy pie chart. Some of the causes are unknown, which are quite impossible to test for. So how can I tell you and your family if your tumor has HR deficiency or not. 
And what we do, what Miria does and what some other tests are trying to do is instead of look for all those causes, we're trying to just look at the tumor and see how it looks in the lab and find out does it have HR deficiency or not? It's essentially a yes or no answer. And my analogy for this, how we need to flip how we're thinking about it, is if you're gonna go shopping for a new car and you walk into the car lot and you see in the corner a car that's wrecked and smoking in a heap, you do not care why that car is wrecked. It could have had a flat tire, it could have been rear-ended, the engine could have caught on fire. All you know is that is not your new car. You are not buying that car. And that's what we're doing in the laboratory. Instead of looking to see what's going on in the tumor, we're looking to see, is that car wrecked or not? Is there HRD or not? So we're, we're flipping away from the causes and just looking to see what things look like. Um, and all those kind of acronyms on the bottom are what we're looking for in the tumor. I'm not gonna go into a ton of details about those, um, but does that car analogy help make sense? That we don't really care about what's going, why a tumor is wrecked, we just wanna know, is, is there something going on? Can that tumor benefit from heart therapy or maybe not? All right, so this is kind of where I need to make sure, this is like my legal requirement, guys, but I am gonna be talking about a test called My Choice CDX. This is a test from Myriad Genetics, so the company that I work for, and it's a test that looks at ovarian tumors to see if they have HRD or not. Um, and this is the, uh, it, has a it is a test that has been reviewed and approved by the FDA in the context of a few clinical trials that Dr. Lewin is gonna just touch on for us. Uh, but this is the intended use from the FDA. So, um, so I know you're recording, so I've checked my legal checkbox, but I also like to show this intended use because if we think about um, the indication for a drug like a PARP inhibitor or really any other drug, um, the FDA will tell us that you can use this drug on this person at this time. They're pretty specific. And what the FDA does for a genetic test is that it's a lot more broad. It's saying it in a really long number of words. But what it's saying is that this test is for any woman with ovarian cancer and can be used at any point in time. On the first day you're diagnosed, five years later, if your physician and your care team are interested in this information, if it will influence your treatment, then you can have this test. Um, and that, that intended use from the FDA is helpful for things like insurance coverage and all of that fun stuff that I'm sure you guys um, have had the uh, have dealt with through the years. Um, but this is this is kind of like the permission that it can be used. And again, it can be used at any point in time as long as you have ovarian cancer and your physician needs this information for treatment information. So it's helpful for planning, it's a tool. Um, and the test is looking at a tumor specifically for BRCA1 and 2 mutations in the tumor. That's the most common cause of HR deficiency, but also looking for um, genomic instability is our fancy way of saying this is how we measure HRD. How we, to, how we see yes or no, is there HR deficiency, yes or no. And we go through and we count these different features, the LOH, TAI, LST. We count how many times. Um, we can think of them almost like colors. 
if they were red, green, and blue, okay, we, when we look at the tumor under the microscope, we see five red dots, we see 18 green dots, we see six blue dots, and then we add them together. And if you have a score that's above a certain threshold, that means yes, your tumor has HR deficiency, or if it's below, then it means no. And women with a higher score in their tumor are more likely to benefit from PARP inhibitor therapy. So I'm gonna pause there. This, this page right here, this, this um, slide is really just what the test is in the ovarian tumor. So you may have BRCA1 and 2 testing done on blood or saliva for the germline family testing. This is tumor testing. Thank you so much, Diana. Yeah. So and I, when you said I'm gonna pause, did that mean that? Yeah. <laughs> Just pause and make sure I'm throwing a lot at you. <laughs> so, gotcha, okay. Um, so I, I just want to make sure I give people a chance to interrupt and chime in. It's not interrupting. Interrupting sounds um, impolite. I have a, I have a <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I, I may have had this done in 2000 and uh, let's see, I'm losing track, 17. But back then, the only thing they tested was the BRCA genes. Mm -hmm. um, I've had, and they were negative the BRCA genes. And then I've had some other testing done that showed the P53 and the PALB2 and um, that instability status, it shows whether it's high or low. Are you saying that, e well, I guess the question I have is if you're negative for BRCA1 and 2, but you have some of these other things, could you potentially benefit from PARP inhibitors? Um, that is potentially maybe, but that what I talk about frequently is patient safety. They want to make sure they're going to give someone a drug because even though a PARP inhibitor is um, not quite as uh, toxic as chemotherapy, it's still a drug. And so I, I think, I mean, I'm sure Dr. Lewin is able to comment much better on this, but they want to make sure that they're going to give you something that's going to give you benefit because it is a drug. Yeah. Um, and so there's a risk along with taking that. Um, and so the only approvals for the use of PARP therapy by the FDA that have been studied in a clinical trial on patients um, are women that have this my choice positive, this genomic instability positive result or a BRCA1 or 2 positive result. So, so anything I'm else, like, uh, like PALB2 or PRIP or P53, those may be interesting and they, um, they may have some research ties to say, oh, maybe this could be helpful, but those are not FDA approved indications. So I think when they really did this test, it, it says whether it's high instability or low instability. Is the yes. high instability the one that might have the PARP inhibitor help it? Yes. And are all PARP inhibitors immunosuppressants? If you have autoimmune illness, are there some that are not, not immunosuppressants, but that, where they alter your immune system oh. to a tar targeted therapy? That's a better question. I don't, I'm not, uh, I don't have a pharmacology background at all. So maybe Dr. Okay. Lewis might be able to answer that one better. Okay. Um, Jean, you might want to just say that one more time just to be sure I understood the question. I mean, PARP inhibitors are what we call like personalized therapy. They're targeted therapies. So it's not really immunotherapy. Um, if you have some underlying um, immunocompromised status from another medical illness, it's not a contraindication to okay. the drug. So it's personalized in the sense that, you know, there are different indications, uh, different FDA labels for which women we can use this drug for. 
Um, and so then that's based on a lot of clinical trials and data in terms of which women we know it will work best in. And I'm definitely going to talk about that. You know, there was a question about our PARP inhibitors used for endometrial cancer, and they're actually being studied now in clinical trials. So there is not an, approve, an approval from the FDA for us to use it in endometrial cancer unless a woman is on a clinical trial. And, that, and that's really one of the benefits about doing clinical trials, if any of you have participated in them, is because it gives us an opportunity to see if certain drugs and treatments um, may be ben more beneficial than the standard regimen, for example. So, is it my turn, Diana? Yes, <laughs> I was going to say that was a good break point okay. too. Um. <laughs> thank you. Well, I just want to say thank you so much. That was really interesting. It's a really um, technical topic for lay people. I appreciate everything you did to try to um, bring analogies into it, and it really helped me a lot, uh, especially thinking about the hot coffee cup with scotch tape. No, I don't want to go there either. Yeah. <laughs> and I see somebody did ask, I want to make sure I emphasize if you have, if you have no BRCA mutations in your tumor or, or yourself, um, will PARPs work? And what the clinical trials and what Dr. Loon will go into is that they've looked at women that have that higher, like all that score of if you count up the red, green and blue and have a high score, those are the women that it works in. So there are other ways. And we see that it's about half of women with ovarian cancer in total. Okay, thanks again. We'll make sure to get to everybody's, um, I'll read through the questions at the end. Um, so Dr. Lewin, so I did, I feel like I did, um, Sorry, I was, I was trying to juggle letting everybody in. I didn't do the best job for both of you. I just want to say really quick, number one, just to back step for a second and th say thanks to Diana and Myriad, who has always been a really great partner for COCA, has always supported what we do. And so I really appreciate your time tonight. And Dr. Lewin has um, a really great education and a great... Um, an impressive resume, but the thing that I really noticed about her also is that she has been an important um, partner and advocate for patients and stuff that she's participated in, both for Coben and for um, OCRA, our Ovarian Cancer Research Alliance. So um, thank you so much for being here tonight and take it away. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I actually love speaking to patients and different advocacy groups. That's probably my most favorite activity other than taking care of my own patients and my family, of course. Um, but I, I put together a lot of slides, probably too many technical slides about a lot of the data with PARP. And I just definitely wanna keep it very simple, but also provide you with the information that you need. I'm gonna go ahead and, and share my screen, but I would love to really make sure that we um, leave a lot of time for, for questions, because I think the questions are really probably the, the most important part of this. Um, are you able to see my slides? Okay, so just to tell you again, I'm, I'm a GYN oncologist. I'm here in Teaneck, New Jersey. Um, are you able to see yeah. for Zoom? Yeah. Okay, good. I don't know why I'm getting this um, funny message. This. Oops. I'm sorry. Zoom is giving me a bit of a, a bit of difficulty. Can you see and hear me again? Um, we can see you, but we lost your screen. So you might need to just uh, reshare again. Okay. I'm so sorry. Of course, Zoom never gives trouble until we're doing these type of things. I think we're all used to it at this point. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe all of them. Okay, hopefully this will work. Um, but at any rate, I'm, I have too many slides than what I'd really like to talk about. So I just really want to hit some of the highlights and be sure that there are definitely time for questions. So I, want, so I would love, you know, this is always something I love to ask groups. Does everyone know, does everyone know um, her BRCA status? By, by a show of hands, I would love to see if that's possible. Um, does everyone who's participating in the call know if you have a BRCA mutation or not? 
if you feel comfortable raising your hand. That's really great. No, I not don't everybody. have one. <laughs> it's but not been tested. Yeah. Well, I, I hope all of you know if you are positive or negative. Um, and the reason this is so important is because, as Diana said, really the national guidelines recommend that all women with ovarian cancer, really regardless of your age or your family history, undergo genetic testing. And I think even though the point of tonight was to talk about tumor testing, it's critically important that we make sure every woman who has or has had ovarian cancer has undergone genetic testing to know what your BRC mutation status is. You know, as Diana mentioned, we do know that a up to about 20% of women with epithelial ovarian cancer will have a BRC mutation. And the reason why I love to talk about this is because even though the national guidelines are so clear, it couldn't be more clear that all women, regardless of age or family history who have ovarian cancer need to have genetic testing for BRC mutations, we still see that less than half of women in the United States today have undergone genetic testing. So I'm very happy to see that so many have said they have had and they know what their BRCA status is because that is, is critically important. There is actually now really a new standard of care for women with ovarian cancer. And this standard of care has really come about probably within the past year. And so it's very important to talk about because hopefully you've had that. If you haven't had that, definitely want you to speak to your doctors about it. But really, when a woman is diagnosed with ovarian cancer, the first step is definitely to do the germline genetic testing. And that is testing blood or saliva, really looking for the BRC mutation. And actually, you know, we now know the best way to do genetic testing is with a full panel. So if you've only had testing for the BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes, it's really important that you go back and have an update test to have the full panel just to see if there are other genes that could potentially be mutated, um, which may not only put you at higher risk for cancer, but also your family members as well, too. Now, Dr. Lewin, can I just ask, do you want to sure. give um, a... Uh, a range of years of if your testing is X amount of years old. Get Great. Ready. So if your testing was done before August of 2014, um, you definitely need to have an update test because the panels were really put on the market, I'd say August of 2014. So prior to that date, we were only testing syndromes. Like we were just testing for BRCA1 and 2, for example, or testing for something called Lynch syndrome, uh, so certain genes. So if the testing was before August of 2014, you definitely need an update test. Since August of 2014, the panels have been on the market. And so hopefully you've had a full panel. Um, and that's definitely something you can show your testing results to your doctor and ask. I personally um, use Myriad's MyRisk. They are really the industry leader when it comes to genetic testing. It's a 35 gene panel uh, that are associated with eight different cancers. So the BRCA1 and 2 genes are included, but also other genes that could put women at, at higher risk for ovarian cancer. So really the gold standard is to first do the germline testing when a woman is diagnosed. And if that is normal, reflexing to tumor testing. And that's what Diana was talking about. And this is looking for acquired mutations. They're also called somatic mutations. These are basically mutations in the tumor itself for BRCA, as well as learning about the HRD score, this homologous recombination deficiency score. Um, and so really that is the standard of care for women that are newly diagnosed with ovarian cancer is to have the germline testing. And as I said, if that's normal, definitely reflex to the tumor testing to see if there's a BRCA mutation in the tumor itself, and also to find out what the HRD score is. You know, it's very important that a reputable lab is, is utilized because you really want to have the most robust, best science. Uh, Myriad really is the industry leader when it comes to not only the germline genetic testing, but also doing the HRD testing. So in the trials that I'm about to speak about in a few minutes, um, Myriad's My Choice, which is the tumor test, looking for the HRD score as well as the tumor BRC mutations was the companion diagnostic. 
and the science is really the robust, the most robust science. Uh, when we're looking at competitors, this is presented at some of our national meetings like SGO and ASCO last year. But it's very important that you use a reputable lab so that if you really do have a BRCA mutation, we're actually finding that. Or if your HRD score shows that you have homologous recombination deficiency, that you really will be eligible for PARP therapy. I guess I just want to interrupt for a second and um, clarify because, you know, a layperson wouldn't, I realize that you use uh, the myriad test, but I mean, the rest of us don't, um, might not know when you say it's important to use a reputable lab. Well, what does a layperson do with that? <laughs> are there, I mean, I know foundation has, uh, I mean, are there a couple others that you just feel like maybe you should list? Because I feel like it's not um, just saying use a reputable lab. We don't have any way as lay people to evaluate that. That's, that's great. I mean, if, if you're doing a tumor test, really looking for homologous recombination deficiencies, I mean, Mary is the best. Foundation Medicine does do testing for something called loss of heterozygosity, but it is only one component of doing the HRD score. And this is something that we're trying to educate practitioners and clinicians about. There has been data that was presented at our national meetings like SGO and ASCO, that if you're only using foundation medicine, for example, you're going to miss at least a third, you know, 30, a third of patients that would be eligible for PARP. Um, so it's very important that reputable labs are used. And it's very tough as a patient to really advocate for that. I think the goal for tonight though, is for you to come away with information like, have I had genetic testing? Have I had HRD tumor testing? And you know, talk to your doctors about that. Uh, that that's really the first part of the conversation is to have those conversations with your physician. Um, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, you know, it's, it's of course very important to have the germline results because we will find out if our offspring, you know, have risks for cancers. But now knowing what a person's HRD status is gives us a lot of options for maintenance and treatment. Um, and so the trials that I, I wanted to talk about very quickly, there were a lot of trials that were presented at a big international meeting called ESMO. It was a European meeting presented about a year and a half ago looking at when women are newly diagnosed with ovarian cancer, after they have surgery and chemotherapy, the standard of care prior to these presentations was women were observed. Uh, many of you who have finished treatment know that usually the standard is just to be observed. These trials actually looked at giving maintenance therapy to women, which was a PARP inhibitor, to see if we could prevent or prolong recurrences. Um, and so we know that we can definitely prolong recurrences, even cure some women by giving them PARP inhibitors as maintenance when they're newly diagnosed. But for those women that are participating tonight that have already had a recurrence, there are definitely indications for using PARP inhibitors in the recurrence setting as well too. And so I just wanna talk about all of those very quickly um, if we have time to go over the trials, is that okay? Okay, I, I probably will try to buzz through all these clinical trials maybe in the next <laughs> five minutes. Just, um, it's great that we've been asking questions as we go and please feel free to interrupt me. I just, I don't wanna get too much into the weeds because I definitely wanna um, give time for questions. So Diana actually went through all of this. Um, so I'm not gonna go through this again, but the bottom line is from these slides is that we know through a lot of different trials and studies that PARP inhibitors work very well in not only women that have germline BRCA mutations, but also somatic mutations too, or mutations in the tumor itself, as well as those cells that have homologous recombination deficiencies. Um, very quickly, this was a very important trial just called SOLO1. This was actually presented in 2018. So this looked at women with germline or somatic BRCA mutations who were newly diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And basically women after surgery and chemotherapy, they were randomized to having a PARP inhibitor. In this case, it was a Laprib or Limparza versus placebo. Um, this was an incredible trial. And basically what we found is that the women who had a BRC mutation, whether germline or somatic, and then had PARP inhibitors, 
had a significant improvement in the time that they remained cancer free. And please don't focus on the numbers. I just wanted to show you what some of the raw data looks like. The updated data was actually just presented at ASCO this year. And the median time that the women remained cancer free who had PARP inhibitors was over 56 months. Uh, compared to women who did not have PARP inhibitors, it was only about uh, 13 months. So this is why it's so important to have that germline and somatic information right when women are diagnosed, because now when women finish chemotherapy, they definitely need to be on Limparza as maintenance to help prevent a recurrence. There are also several studies in the recurrent setting, and just some of these trials are things like SOLO2, NOVA, Ariel 3. I'm happy to go into as much detail. I just want to give you a very high level quick view just to know that these studies exist. These are for women that have recurrent ovarian cancer who have been treated with chemotherapy, who then go on to PARP inhibitors. We see in the recurrent setting that PARP inhibitors really work well for all women. Um, and at least if you're at least partially platinum sensitive following chemotherapy in the recurrent setting, you should definitely be on a PARP inhibitor as maintenance. This slide just shows you that if you have a germline or a tumor BRC mutation, your response is gonna be so much better than if you don't. And that's what the top line kind of shows in these curves compared to the bottom line. These are the three studies that were presented at that big European meeting, that ESMO meeting that I mentioned a year and a half ago. Uh, these were really game changers when it comes to newly diagnosed women with ovarian cancer. One is called Prima and the other is called Paola. Uh, Vilia, which is the third trial, it's not an FDA approved drug yet, so it's not as helpful for us, but the first two are very important. And just very quickly, the Prima trial looked at all women with newly diagnosed ovarian cancer Following surgery and chemotherapy, these women went on to norepirib, which is a JULA, a different PARP versus placebo, and they were followed. And essentially, all the women who were on uh, norepirib did much better. They had a much longer period of time to be cancer-free, as you can see from the top green line here. Don't, don't worry about the numbers, as I mentioned. Whenever you see two lines like this that are very far apart, it just shows you they're very statistically significant and definitely very you know, important um, from a medical standpoint. But what we found most importantly in this trial was that the women who had deficiencies in homologous recombination or HRD deficiencies in their tumor had a much more robust response to PARP and remained cancer-free even longer. Um, it, was, it was actually very incredible, which is why the standard of care for women now is to do this HRD or tumor testing right when they're diagnosed so that if they do have deficiencies in homologous recombination, we can put them on PARP inhibitors after finishing chemotherapy. Um, I'm just going to go through this very quickly because I definitely want to leave time for slides, for questions rather. Um, this was the other Sentinel trial. What was different about this trial is that they used a different PARP inhibitor, Olaparib, as maintenance, but they also used Avastin. These women all had surgery and chemotherapy and Avastin because that's really the European standard. When women are first diagnosed with ovarian cancer, they all receive Avastin. And then in the maintenance phase, they either received Avastin by itself or Avastin plus PARP. And essentially what we found is that there was a dramatic improvement in the time that women remain cancer free, especially if they had homologous recombination deficiencies or HRD, if they had both PARP and Avastin versus Avastin alone. So these Sentinel trials really revolutionized how we care for women who are newly diagnosed. I see there are questions coming through, but maybe I'll just quickly finish these and then we'll make sure we get to all the questions. Um, so this slide just shows that tumor BRC mutations or somatic have a much more robust response to PARP inhibitor therapy. And this just kind of shows you all three trials basically um, an improvement with PARP inhibitors to prevent recurrence, but particularly in the women that had deficiencies and homologous recombination. I think what I'd love to just get to here is that importantly, the quality of life was just as good for people that were on PARP as not in all of the studies that I just spoke about. Um, and really that 
We now know for newly diagnosed women, and this is why clinical trials are so important because we're really advancing the field all the time with this information, is that we definitely need the germline testing and the tumor or somatic testing right when these women are diagnosed. Because now really the standard of care is if you have a germline or somatic BRCA mutation, you definitely need to be on Lymparsa maintenance when you finish chemotherapy. Or if you have HRD, these homologous recombination deficiencies, you definitely need to be on PARP inhibitor therapy as maintenance as well. So for women that have had a recurrence already, there are definitely indications for PARP inhibitor use if you've had multiple lines of chemotherapy. It's not just for newly diagnosed women. So, you know, the, the, um, I mentioned the PRIMA trial, but the QUADRA trial was for women that had had three or more lines of therapy. Um, and so there is an FDA a, a, um, approval for Zajula or Niraparib, it's called the QUADRA trial, for women that have had at least three or more lines of therapy and their tumor does have HRD testing. So for those of you that um, are beyond first line, and not really a candidate now for maintenance therapy, as I mentioned, you still could be a candidate for PARP inhibitor, particularly if you have HRD in your tumor. So the HRD signature does not change. I think somebody asked that question. So you can take tumor from your initial surgery or your initial biopsy, you know, or from your recurrence, and it either will be positive or negative. It doesn't, so it can be stored, um, or you can also take it from the cytology as well too, or the pleural fluid. But really PARPs can also be an option, particularly Zajula, if you've had at least three or more lines of therapy and still have HRD, homologous recombination deficiencies. Um, so with that, I definitely would like to stop and take some questions. I'm happy to go into a lot more detail about the trials. I just don't want to bog anyone down with any of the numbers. But I think the key takeaway is that we have a lot of excellent data, some of the best data that we've ever seen in ovarian cancer for women who have tumors with HRD to now have maintenance at the beginning because we know women are at such high risk for recurrence. And we've seen that we're now actually curing some women that we didn't ever cure in the past and certainly extending the time that they're cancer free by having PARP inhibitors. And that's why the HRD testing is so critical when these women are diagnosed. And as I mentioned in the recurrence setting, there are also opportunities for PARP too, depending on your status of your HRD. Thank you so much, Dr. Lewin. I'm so, um, you're so generous with your time and um, kind to answer questions. And we do have a bunch. So I'll go ahead and I'm just going to, um, and we will get to just unmuting people too. But why don't I go ahead and catch up on some of the questions that have been in the chat, if you're okay with that? Of course, definitely. <laughs> um, so Carol asks, um, about tumor testing. She said, I remember doing genetic testing, but don't recall the tumor being tested. Now, this is, again, I think you guys uh, might remember that, that uh, I think it was Diana that said, it's really just been the last couple years that this is, has come into regular use. Is that right, Dr. Lewin? And what does somebody do if they have not had tumor testing yet? I think it would be important to have that conversation with your with your doctors, your treating doctors, you know, just to say, you can say, I participated in this webinar and I'd love to know, did I have tumor testing? Um, you know, does my tumor have HRD? Am I a candidate for PARP inhibitors? Patients ask me these questions all the time. Um, and I think that there's just so much literature and things out there, particularly in advocacy groups about PARP inhibitors now that it's a good question. So I would ask, I would ask your doctor if you've had tumor testing, if your tumor has been you know, tested for HRD and are you a candidate for PARP therapy? I think these are really important questions to ask and your doctor should have good answers for you. And then if it wasn't and they have, let's say somebody doesn't have um, a tumor anymore or not a you know, like sizable tumor, they can go ahead and take that initial tumor that would have been saved. That's correct. Okay. The, the pathology blocks are saved for at least 10 years, so they can use the initial tumor that's been saved in pathology. So you can go back many years to collect the original sample. Um, Kathy asks, uh, what if tumor testing is not possible? What, what does that mean uh, for her as far as knowing whether a part makes sense or not? My is that question was, um, he didn't get enough tissue to test the tumor 
originally and then after chemo it didn't show anything because it was gone so i really don't have any saved tumor cells to be tested when when did you finish chemotherapy kathy if i may ask july july um you know that's a common problem actually that we run into because sometimes you know women have a biopsy and then receive neoadjuvant chemotherapy so that's chemotherapy first and that's great you've had such an excellent response that there's no tumor left um, it's a problem um, you know one option is you know some clinicians treat all patients who are newly diagnosed with PARP inhibitors um, you know there, if there's an opportunity in the future for any biopsies, God forbid, that might be another opportunity, right. Right. you know, but you're not, you're not alone because we do find this. And that's why we're trying to educate clinicians to get a huge enough biopsy when women are first diagnosed, because there are a lot of people like you that have had such a great response. That's, and then if the biopsy initially isn't big enough, we can't get that tumor testing, but, um, and the other question I have terms of cancer markers, um, does it affect, I guess, the Zedula can affect your uh, CA-125? It should not. I mean, it shouldn't, you know, the CA-125, if that was an initial marker for you, right. the, the PARPs are not going to affect it, only if, you know, there's a recurrence or any progression. Okay. But the, the PARPs will hopefully treat that um, if that happens. Okay. Thank you. Um, Sandy asks, uh, looks like she got Keras testing and she has a PDL1 uh, gene mutation. Does that have uh, bearing on uh, using a PARP inhibitor? So, PDL1 is something that might be helpful for Keytruda. It's an immunotherapy drug that you mm -hmm. might have heard about. Yes, um, so, that's where the PDL1 gene is helpful. Um, Karis, I think, is just now starting to do HRD testing, but they're new in this field. And so that's why I would really advocate using Myriad. Um, I guess that's my disclosure is that I am a speaker for them just because I've been using their uh, germline and tumor testing now for probably 15 years since I've been in practice because they really are the industry leader. So... Uh, it's hard to really tell your doctor what company to use, <laughs> but... Um, oh, I've actually been very successful doing that. Have you? Well, that's awesome. <laughs> you know, if my if one of my patients came to me and said, Dr. Lou, and I heard this great talk and I need to have my choice done, I would say no problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good for you guys. You Ovarian cancer patients are some of the most passionate, informed patients that I've ever met. And I think you should tell your doctor. I heard this G1 oncologist speak and she said, my choice is the best. And you can, yeah. you can ask for that. Because yes. Karis, you know, we don't have any data from them about how they validate their results. While they're very good about, you know, doing next gen sequencing for other types, but for HRD, really the industry leader they were the companion diagnostic and all those trials that I talked to you about is really myriad. So yes, if I would say to your doctor, I want to have my choice done to look for somatic BRCA mutations and HRD. Good for you, Sandy. Like I said, if my patients asked me for that, I would have no problem with it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Just one other very quick question, if you don't mind. Um, I do have endometrial. I have a, uh, a clear cell. Uh, so yeah, so it is different. I even questioned being on this call and was told that, you know, it would be. Um, but just quick, and because somebody mentioned CA-125, isn't it true that CA-125 was meant for ovarian and not endometrial? So C125 can be a marker for just peritoneal inflammation. And so for some women with clear cell cancers and other, you know, endometrial cancers, they might have had that as a marker initially. So if we happen to have it and we know it's a marker, we'll often follow it. So, you know, it's a very good marker for ovarian cancer, but it can be a marker for other endometrial cancers as well, too. Okay. Um, but, you. but, you know, for, for you, the, the studies are now ongoing looking at PARPs in endometrial cancer. It's an active area of research. So, you know, clinical trials are trying to determine if it's helpful in that tumor type as well. So great question. Okay, great. And can you give us, I'm not sure how to spell this meridid, meridid or what, what did you call it? Myriad? 
Uh, my choice. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. So my choice is M Y. I can type it into the chat box. M Y. Thank you. And then choice. C H O I C. My choice. Okay. So this this is the tumor test that looks for the tumor BRCA mutation, um, and also it gives the HRD score. And we've looked at comparing this to foundation because that's probably they're probably number two in the market and really the data does show that my choice is the best when it comes okay. to accurately identifying which tumors have hrd thank you um there's a question on uh that someone asks can you have taxol avastin and parp at the same time so usually not, that's a great question. We've looked at PARPs with chemotherapy and it's actually turned out to be too toxic um, and or you've had to lower the dose of the PARP inhibitor so much. So really the best is to give carbotaxel with Avastin and then when the carbotaxel are finished, continue the Avastin with the PARP inhibitor. So PARPs are usually used, you know, either with Avastin or by themselves, but not really with chemotherapy just because of the toxicity. Sherry asks, um, and this is a, just a, a PARP question, can you speak to the differences there may be in the dosage amount of PARP? I'm on my third reduction of the labyrinth right now. So there are several PARP inhibitors on the market. I mentioned Elaparib, Zajula, and there is uh, Rubraca. Um, they do, each of them has different uh, side effect profiles. Um, um, if you are on, you're on your third dose reduction of a lap rib. So, you know, a lap rib is usually my PARP of choice just because I find it to have the best side effect profile and to be the most well tolerated. Um, there is good efficacy data or how well the PARPs work at lower doses. Sometimes for certain patients, I've switched to another PARP because sometimes it, you have a lot of toxicities and then you switch to a different PARP and you may not. So I think those are all, I would definitely talk to your doctor about, you know, how well does this PARP work at whatever dose level you're on. Um, we have a question from Alyssa that says, my oncologist says that clinical trials aren't an option for me and that I will be done with my treatments as soon as my six chemotherapy sessions are over, can I send my genetic testing, uh, blood and tumor results to you for a second opinion? Yes, absolutely. That is one of the nice things about COVID is we now can do telemedicine and see patients from all over the country uh, so you don't have to travel. But absolutely, I would be happy to review anyone's information. Thank you. Um, I, I just really want to prevent a reoccurrence, so I want as many eyes on it as I absolutely. can. Absolutely. Is this your is this your initial initial treatment? Um, yeah, I was diagnosed October twenty third, and I've had three chemotherapy treatments so far. So you know, it's definitely important that you have the My Choice testing if it hasn't been done. Yeah, uh, just the, yeah, I'm waiting for the results of the genetic testing. I have my genetic okay. testing meeting. February 11th, actually. Oh, that, that's good. So make sure they've done the genetic testing, the full panel, and also the tumor testing as well, too. Yep. Um, good, good, good. Why, yes, yep. I'd be happy to talk through any of those with you. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. And I can just contact you from, you have your contact information on the link for this, or? Um, I'll make sure, I'll make sure that they have my office information for sure. I would be happy to do that. Great. Thank you so I'm much. happy to follow up with that. Um, Carrie uh, says, I'm net after two years of first line treatment, germline BRCA negative. If I asked to have my tumor tested and would be a good candidate for PARP, is it too late to start? Two years after first line treatment? Yeah. So, you know, at this point, um, at this point, this, you know, the studies were really looking at starting PARP inhibitors within about six to eight weeks of finishing chemotherapy. So we actually don't really have data um, to show about using PARP now, two years later. So for my patients like you, I recommend that we just follow you. Um, you know, and if we, we always have that opportunity to use it in the future. Um, but there's you know, also a very good chance you might never have a recurrence, hopefully. And so you might not actually need it. I think we usually try to start PARPs you know, probably within about six months of finishing initial chemotherapy. 
Um, so at this point, there's, there's a good chance you might not even need it, which would be wonderful. Um, hey, I just want to say, Jean Pantone, I'm, you say I skipped your question and I'm so sorry. Just unmute yourself and please ask, you, ask it. I saw you somewhere. But Carrie can definitely still have her tumor tested. I think having that information would be very helpful. I just wouldn't put you on a PARP right now, even if it were HRD positive. Gina on iPhone, would you like to ask your question? Are you muted? I'll go up and look for it if you don't unmute. Um, Jean, you wanna go ahead? Sorry, we can't hear you. I will scroll back up. Sorry, just scrolling down everybody. Does anybody want to unmute and ask a question? All right, I'm gonna try one more time up here. Thanks for your patience, everyone. I'm having trouble finding it, Jean. So let's um, let's make sure that we um, do some follow up. And get something about her original question was about liver. I, I'm assuming she's having a speaker problem right now. Yeah, um, I've seen that too. Um, great. I had okay. a camera problem before, so I get it. Um, I see she asked about my choice um, HRD negative test and about liver tissue. Um, so I think she'll have to clarify for us. I'm happy to put my email address in if she wants to um, ask. But if it is an ovarian tumor that has metastasized to liver, so just making sure it's not a, a, a primary liver cancer, then yes, we can test that tissue. Um, and I'll type in my email. <laughs> so. Great, thank you so much. I look thinks that's going to be the most direct way to handle this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, typing my, I'm typing in my email too, so you have that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Can both. anyone hear me? Oh, we can now. Oh, good. I forgot the star before the six. Uh, uh, my name is Beatrice. Um, and I have been diagnosed with um, high-grade serous ca carcinoma that um, is metastatic to the lymph nodes. And I have received uh, four treatments now of the paclitaxel, carboplatin, and avastin. Uh, my last CA-125, well, my first CA-125 test started off at 1,246. And my last one came back at 32, which was I was very pleased. The CT scans show um, they can't even see anything anymore. Um, all of my reproductive organs had pretty much conglomerated into one big mass with a bunch of uh, lymph nodes um, amassed in there. And so I just want to understand, um, am I correct in understanding that should continue this treatment uh, for the full six uh, treatments with those three medications. And then I'm being advised to continue with the Avastin for one full year after that. So am I correct in understanding that that is the proper procedure, but after six months, um, six months after this primary treatment, that's when a PARP should be added if I test no. positive for one of these things. No, you're you're definitely getting the proper treatment. So I completely agree with uh, your treatment recommendations. But 
The PARP inhibitor starts, just make sure you've had the MyChoice HRD testing. The PARP inhibitor starts when you finish the carbotaxol. So it could continue with the Avastin in the maintenance phase. I, I also saw a question come through about will insurance pay for tumor testing? And absolutely it will. I just want to say that, you know, be, because ovarian cancer, there are no insurance uh, blockades when it comes to genetic germline testing and somatic tumor testing as well. I've been testing patients for too many years to count now, and I've really never had an insurance issue with the tumor or the germline testing. So that definitely should not be a barrier to getting that information for you. Okay, great. Um, and uh, my tumor was not tested. I had um, surgery, a complete hysterectomy, October 6th. So was I correct in understanding that uh, these the tumor and would have been saved for 10 years? That's correct. So they can definitely go back now and do the tumor testing to do the My Choice testing to look for somatic BRCA mutations as well as the HRD status and the HRD score. Great. Well, thank you, ladies, all so much for this very helpful webinar. I've appreciated it very much. You bet. Thanks. For Hi, this. This is Jean. Can I? I'm so sorry. Hey. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'll make it quick, and I appreciate this. Thank you so much. So for Diana and, do and doctor, um, I'm BRCA1 and 2 negative. I'm advanced stage 4 PPC with METs to my liver and bones. Um, I've been second line of chemo for four months here. Um, I was told by my oncologist, from foundation that I'm HRD negative. I've been talking with my gen, uh, genetic counselor and I'm in the process right now as we speak to see if I still have enough liver tissue as I did not have debulking from liver biopsy to see if I have tissue for the assay to send to my choice CDX. So will that test, if, if I have enough tissue, if not, maybe another biopsy, Will that test determine more than positive or negative status, but more the behavior aspects of the tissue to see if I am perhaps eligible for PARP earlier than later type of thing? Will that test work with that, those aspects of uh, the tissue, since I'm, quote, negative at this time for HRD? Yeah, it's um, so the prior testing doesn't, influence at all. We're able to do the test on, uh, like we, like I said, um, the liver should be fine to do testing on as long as we can get that sample in. Um, and there are requirements that the, that the physician right. and the pathologist will have about how much we need. So we're not getting a teeny tiny speck where we need a, a small piece of it. Um, in order to complete the testing, um, but it can be done on that liver sample. Any prior testing doesn't matter for what we're going to find, um, and it doesn't matter for insurance coverage. So um, I, I know I think Dr. Bruin's done probably similar scenarios where she's had prior testing and then sent HRD. Now that it's more common, mm -hmm. but then if it's if w will this aspect of the assay from this tissue maybe show that I'm I, I am HRD positive, so I can be considered for PARP. Right now, my oncologist is telling me I'm negative, so it wouldn't be indicated. That's my question. Um, yeah. it, yes, it could because foundation, you know, is not as accurate when it comes to HRD testing. You know, we have data that was presented at some of our national meetings that if you're okay. just doing foundation, because they they just look at one component, it's called an LOH score you're actually going to miss at least a third of patients, so 33% that Myriad would otherwise catch as HRD. Um, so yes, I think it's definitely worth sending it to Myriad for my choice. Just because foundation okay. said it's negative does not okay. mean you know, a, th you know, a third of patients will be missed. Okay, excellent. Thank you both. That gives me hope. And thanks for your patience while I was muted. <laughs> No problem. 
Okay, well, I don't think I've seen any uh, more questions come into the chat. So uh, again, I want to thank you all for sharing your perspectives and your uh, knowledge on this issue. Again, it's uh, new for so many of us. So we're really learning a lot and learning how to be good advocates for ourselves. And um, so thank you very much. If you, if you would allow one more question, um, sure. would you just clarify, I took notes and such, but I just want to clarify the My Choice testing, that includes um, the germline testing and the HRD testing and the BRCA testing and also um, the tumor, the somatic tumor testing. That, am I correct in understanding all of that? So my choice just looks at the tumor. So it'll give you the somatic or the tumor BRCA status. And it'll also give you the HRD score, just those two things. Um, and I'm very proud of you guys for comp comprehending all this terminology because we can't even get the doctors to really understand all of it by and large. So just so you know, these are very complicated, confusing terms. I think you're doing a great job. Um, well, thank but, you. And I'm sorry, would you please repeat what you said? That's just the tumor te just somatic the, testing? Correct. So my choice is just the tumor testing. So it's just looking for the somatic BRCA1 and 2. So that's kind of what's acquired in the tumor itself, as well as the HRD score. And that, that's separate from germline testing, which is different. That looks for genes that we inherit from our parents, and that has to be done through blood or through you know, buccal DNA, buccal saliva. But that if you remember done. spitting in like a little tube about that big, then that could have been your germline test or having some blood done. But I think yeah, these I'm are very- sure I have not had that done. These are very important things to talk to your doctor about. I would really empower and encourage all of you to make sure you've had germline testing, a full panel, and ask for the results. You should keep those yourself. And also ask if you've had the tumor HRD testing. Um, and, and have a copy of it. Uh, these are very important things that, you know, when we're taking care of ovarian cancer, we need this information. Um, and are these conversations to have with the gynecological oncologist or yes. with the medical oncologist? Well, good question. You, it, um, you either or both, um, you know, I do surgery and give chemotherapy. So I'm the one, you know, taking care of this, but um, I, you could have it with either, particularly the medical oncologist. If you know he or she is the one giving you chemotherapy, definitely with them. Uh, I would have that. I would have that discussion. Very good. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Um, Alyssa had a question. Yeah, sorry. I have another question. Um, it's I did the BRCA one and BRCA two tests in 2018 because my grandmother had breast cancer and my sister had breast cancer. Um, and they, that I tested negative for the those genes then, but my CHEK2 was like four times the normal limit, and my doctors never informed me of any of that. Is that something that they legally needed to do at the time of that test, or I'm just wondering if, if like all of this could have been avoided, and I might have a malpractice suit against my old doctor because. I had so many complications when I had my child that I was begging them for a hysterectomy and they wouldn't give it to me. Um, and I could have avoided all of this, I feel like. I mean, I would have to take a look at your genetic results before really, you know, giving you more advice on that, to be honest. I'm not okay. exactly sure what mutation you're talking about, so I'd have to take a look. I think we could talk about that one-on-one, -on -one, perhaps. Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll try to touch base with you hopefully tomorrow. Thank you. Where would one get the gene line testing? So either the G1 oncologist or medical oncologist could do it, or some places have a genetic counselor who does it. But the germline testing, you know, like you, you spit into a cup or they take your blood, really is the first step that needs to be done. So 
either the GYN or medical oncologist or the genetic counselor. You know, Miriam. I think something that's good to remember too is, or to know, is that it's not just. Um, Dr. Lewin saying this is a good idea. She's following national criteria. So there's a group called the NCCN or the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. That's who a lot of gynonks and medonks look to. They put out a guideline about different ways for literally everything under the sun about treating different cancers. Um, but they also discuss genetic testing and 100% of women with ovarian cancer meet the criteria to do genetic testing. So it should be standard. I, I think Dr. Lewin said it several times, new standard of care that everyone should absolutely do it or at least be offered it. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question. Um, for myself. So I have low grade ovarian cancer and every and it has um, recurred once already. Um, possibly it's recurring again. They are still waiting, to do some more screenings later on. Um, but my question is, is, would any of this be helpful to me because they haven't really had a whole lot of stuff to test for that kind of thing. Originally, I didn't have the genetic testing done because I was the only person I knew of in my family who had any kind of cancer. Um, and so I was like, I don't need it. It's probably just some random thing. Um, so is there any of this going to be something that would be useful to me? That's a great question. Um, so, you know, low grade ovarian cancers are definitely different than the high grade serous ovarian cancers. And that's where the high grade serous are the ones where we talk about this 20% having a germline BRCA mutation. So those statistics for low grade serous don't really, don't really apply. And the trials that we talked about were in women with high grade serous. So the low grade serous is definitely a different entity of which to you know, offer different treatment recommendations. For my, for my patients though, you know, so it's really the genetic, all the things we're talking about are most important for the high grade serous, which is definitely different than low grade. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's, a good, that's a good question. Although sometimes for some of my patients with low grade serous, I've still just written ovarian cancer and gotten the testing done anyway. Uh, because the insurance companies will not, you know, make, they're not that sophisticated to look low grade versus high grade. So sometimes, you know, I still want to have that information for my patients and, you know, especially if they have children. So if you just list ovarian cancer, the test will be covered. Okay. It's just more, it's not, not, not as high of a chance there'll be a, you know, a BRC mutation. Yeah. Correct. Good to know. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thanks everybody that's uh, hung on and, um, and thank you so much to our presenters, Dr. Lewin and Diana Turco. Thank you so much. And uh, we really appreciate your time, um, especially because it's later for both of you, I believe, <laughs> than here in, uh, in Colorado. But um, thank you for your generosity. Thanks for having us. Thank you for well, having us. We will also, um, just so you all know, we'll um, go ahead and just send the link to the recording to everyone that's that